think it's great. It's great because uh, a lot of my students that actually wanted to come as well to, to watch, they're not going to be able to, so they they can rewatch later on. Yes. Uh, I, I just can't see anything of you, so if there's any issue, let me know. Um, okay. Also, okay. I only see my screen, that's it. <laughs> uh -huh. No, that's great. And I think we can maybe start. I think people will get in. Uh, I'm just going to give them a message in Portuguese very quickly. Então, pessoal, peço só que vocês ponham o nome de vocês tá? aqui no chat. É, quem não colocou ainda na entrada e quando for sair também. Tá? Just asking them to put their names on the, on the chat. Just to, to have the control of whoever's here. Okay, so uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we have the pleasure to, to have here Professor Denis Gebauer. I, I think it's Gebauer that is... That... Yeah, it's, it's correct. Yes, Gebauer. So. Gebauer. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much again for, for having the time. I know it's almost the end of the day and we're, we're getting you here. So for us, it's great to have you. And Professor Dennis uh, completed his PhD at the Max Planck Institute of Colloids and Interfaces in Germany in 2008. And I'm getting your biography from the, from the ORCID website. And he stayed at the Stockholm University as a postdoctoral researcher for two years. Uh, he was a research fellow also at the University of Constance. Is that how you say it? How? Yes, correct, yes. And an assistant professor there as well until 2019. Uh, he is now a professor at the Institute of Inorganic Chemistry at Leibniz University, Hanover. And his research interests currently focus on classical concepts of nucleation and crystallization, as well as bimineralization and materials chemistry in general. So he will be talking a little bit about that here. So thank you once again, Professor, for, for getting the time to, to come here. If there's any issue, I'll, I'll talk and just let you know. But thank you once again. Yes, please feel free to just interrupt me. So thank you very much for having me and inviting me. As I said before, I would have loved to come to Rio and be there in person. The, the weather is actually very bad here. Um, however, I'm also happy to do this online and um, talk a little bit about the mechanisms of calcium carbonate formation. And we will talk essentially about, we will try to establish this diagram here in my talk. talk so I don't want to lose too much words uh, on this on this title the slide so all of this will hopefully become clear and be clear once we are finished in 40 50 minutes or so so um calcium carbonate um the first slide i prepared is, is about that because you may ask yourself oh, why do we talk about calcium carbonate why is this interesting so you may know it as chalk or limestone and then say it's a pretty boring material but it's not because it's actually the most abundant biomineral. So if you have a very nice beach, which is white and shiny, it's mostly not silica sand, but actually calcium carbonate uh, mineral that's distributed, but only if the beach is very white. So essentially all the shells are made of calcium carbonate and they have very interesting material properties. And that's why they are studied also for a long time, how they are formed. And I will touch that later on again. And it also has a great industrial importance. So it's used as a pigment of filler in paint, uh, for example, as a filler in paper. It's very important in cigarette paper, for example, to control the burning also. And it's actually the major ingredient of cement. And cement is yeah, the material that is most used by the humankind. Uh, and of course, here of also calcium carbonate plays a big role. However, it's not always about the formation of calcium carbonate that is wanted or used as in building industry, for example. Sometimes it can also be bad that calcium carbonate is formed and you know that um, from the issues that come along with water hardness. So it may trouble your own appliances like the washing machine or uh, here your faucet, uh, but it of course concerns also industry. So if you have heating or cooling circuits, 
the formation of calcium carbonate can be a big issue. And then it's, of course, important to find means and to understand how to inhibit the formation of calcium carbonate. From a scientific point of view, it's a very nice model system, actually, because you can consider the bond between calcium and carbonate ions to be essentially purely ionic in character. So you only have to think about Coulomb interactions, and it's just two ions, one molecular ion, which has a more complex uh, speciation. We know that about the protonation, I will touch on that later, but for the solid, it's actually a pretty simple one. You can have water in solid calcium carbonates. These are the so-called pseudopolymorphs, and some, some years ago, there was actually a new crystal structure the, the, found by the Max Planck Institute of Colloids and Interface by the food group of Peter Fratzel, which just half a mole of water per mole of calcium carbonate. What I've listed here are the actual polymorphs, so they are anhydrous, and uh, there are three of them, calcite, aragonite, and batterite, and they have different crystal structures. And um, this is pretty nice because uh, we can understand how polymorphism may be controlled in a yeah, simple system, which is simple chemically, um, but uh, still has some yeah, structural variety. And I've put it in red here. Um, calcium carbonate is also known for its amorphous precursors or intermediates. So what I've um, put here as ACC means amorphous calcium carbonate. And I will talk a lot about this intermediate form in this lecture or seminar because it's um, of such great importance uh, in the precipitation pathway, actually, also. And what we shouldn't forget is also that it's linked to the climate issue that we are currently facing in the world community. You know, we have an increasing amount of CO2 and um, thus a heating of the Earth atmosphere. And of course, the carbonate anion, it binds chemically CO2. And uh, in that way, like these calcium carbonate cycles are also linked to the CO2 cycles. And there might be means um, of binding, for example, calcium carbonate or CO2 in advanced building materials. Um, and that's another uh, yeah, aspect why calcium carbonate may be important for us uh, as humankind. So you see there are a lot of issues where calcium carbonate is important and the formation of uh, calcium carbonate. And that's why, of course, it's yeah, wanted to have a working theory of uh, how these minerals form. And for these theories, you have different expectations that I already touched upon. So the first one maybe is uh, under which conditions can a given mineral form yeah, occur thermodynamically. And this is actually pretty well understood. However, it does not only concern the solid forms like calcite, aragonite, batterite. It may also concern like intermediates, be it ACC, like the amorphous form uh, or something similar if you want to make use of it in making materials or if you want to avoid the precipitation of calcium carbonate. And then, of course, you would like to know what determines actually the atomic structure of the finer mineral, so the problem of polymorphism. And I've showed you or mentioned the different forms of crystalline calcium carbonate, but the prime example for controlling polymorphism is, is carbon or the allotropes of carbon. So you have graphite and diamond. It's chemically the same. However, the material properties couldn't be much more different actually in a solid. It's not so extreme for the calcium carbonate polymorphs. Um, however, there are still differences. That's why in biomineralization, the muscle shell, for example, controls aragonite over calcite formation. And then you may want to know what are the precursors that play a role in the formation of these minerals and what are their properties. And precursors are the earliest stages. So are these simple ions or is there something else forming? And then when we think about intermediates, then, then I mean um, solid intermediates. So these could be amorphous or they could also be liquid intermediates or like also crystalline intermediates on the way to calcite. You could form metastable batterite or aragonite on the pathway. And then, of course, you want to know what's the kinetics of the occurrence of these different forms, um, how fast do they occur on, and on which timescales, and can you somehow, via this nucleation, influence particle shape and size. And there are many, many more questions. I could go on and on. And in the context of yeah, being a chemist and a material scientist, perhaps, it's, of course, the main question to understand how 
or if we can control all or any of these aspects uh, towards article formation. And for that, of course, you have to have a functioning and a working theory. So to, to wrap this issue up of, of nucleation, the question is how are the first tiny nuclei formed from their building units? And of course, it depends on the type of crystal. So we are talking about calcium carbonate here, so it's ionic uh, building blocks, but of course you could transfer this also to molecular or atomic crystals. So here I've just depicted, and you see sort of the sign language on my title slide. So we have different ions, calcium and carbonate ions. Pick whatever color you want to be calcium or carbonate. It doesn't really matter. And then you may form a tiny precursor, a nanocrystal in solution, which may just grow. However, you don't really know how like step by step in an atomic perspective this works or if these small species occur at all, if there's something else in between when we grow to the final crystal. And here I want to put the muscle shell again because you know this is 95% calcium carbonate or so, a little bit of organics and it doesn't remind you at all of a crystal. So here you have the correspondence principle, the atomic structure de determines the morphology in a geological one, which is somehow indicated here in this, this very simplified scheme. However, for the calcium carbonate in the muscle shell, it does not work at all like that. And that's why it has these great material properties also. And of course, we would like to copy that and understand it. And you may say, well, we know all of this. We know how nucleation works. That's the so-called classical nucleation theory. So we can just open our textbook and yeah, understand how it works. And in fact, this um, classical nucleation theory has been dominating our comprehension of, of how nucleation works for, for more than a century, actually. And it dates back to the ideas of Gibbs. So I've shown a picture of him here, and that is one of two major publications of his, where he's outlining the first thoughts of how nucleation could work. However, he never formulated um, the equations, and you may know that he was very skilled at formulating equations and developing thermodynamics, because he's actually one of the fathers of thermodynamics, and he developed what's in physical chemistry textbooks, essentially in these two papers that I mentioned here. However, with nucleation theory, he was careful and actually the first quantitative expression was formulated by two German scientists. However, they did some error in the kinetic P factor and that was uh, corrected by Becker and During in 35. And this is what is often referred to as yeah, the finalization, finalization of classical nucleation theory. However, there's also uh, Russian, Russian or a Soviet scientist, Seldovich, who made another important contribution to the prefactor in 1943. So by the basic physical chemistry, this is all very similar. And when I talk about classical nucleation theory, I mean this framework um, and I won't go into too much detail with the prefactor. So we would just want to understand uh, the basics of this before we go yeah, to the more advanced um, theories or the newer theories. So here's again what the picture that I painted before. So we want to go from the homogeneous solution, uh, water is not shown here, to a final particle. And classical nucleation theory assumes that the first nuclei just form based upon stochastic collisions. So there's no real chemical interaction bringing the ions together. They just sort of randomly collide in the solution and um, building up stochastic nuclei. And um, these fluctuations, they are assumed to behave as if they were already macroscopic particles. And this is the major crux of classical nucleation theory and the so-called capillary assumption. We know from nanochemistry, so we put so much work and effort into making materials small because we know they behave so differently at the nanoscale. Um, and this is sort of counter by this theory, assuming that it's not the case. And of course, it's a major weakness. So, and we can directly write down these thermodynamics developed by Gibbs. And if we put 
n eins, so n is just a number from one phase into the into the other. We can write down the difference in the chemical potential, and this is just a change in free enthalpy. So the big G here, capital G, is also for Gibbs name actually over the uh, number of atoms that are exchanged. And we define this as a so-called affinity. It depends on where you look. Sometimes it's also called supersaturation. Um, it's not so consistent. Um, I highlight this here because also the sign convention in classical nucleation theory is somehow odd. Um, so we make the difference here in a manner that if this is negative, the affinity is negative, then uh, it's thermodynamically impossible for nucleation to occur. If it's greater than zero positive, then it's a spontaneous process. And when we are equal zero, then we are actually in equilibrium. So from the concentration dependence of the chemical potential, we can directly write down this equation. So KT is just thermal energy uh, in not molar quantities, but per atom. And we put here the logarithm of the supersaturation ratio. And we will be talking about calcium carbonate. So it's the actual ion activity product, IAP, divided by the solubility product. So you know the solubility product is a constant for the different polymorphs. And it's also given by uh, actually activity of calcium times activity of carbonate. So, and if this is the solubility product, then of course the supersaturation ratio is one. And then this, the logarithm of one is zero, the affinity becomes um, um, zero, and we are in equilibrium. If your ion activity product is larger than the solubility, then you're supersaturated, supersaturated, and nucleation can occur in principle. However, we know from experience that it's not a spontaneous process. So if you're a little bit supersaturated, there are situations where you can actually wait for years before nucleation would occur. So there's a antagonist, a counter player, and this is um, yeah, the case only for very small nuclei where we have to think about it. So in the thermodynamics of macroscopic bodies, we can largely neglect, neglect it, but when we make a Nucleus small, so I've plotted here the total number of ions in the nucleus in percent over the surface, um, ions in percent, then of course if we make it very small, then we go strongly towards 100% surface ions. So I've tried to illustrate this again in 2D here for, on this uh, uh, slide um, for a yeah, hexagonally packed cluster, essentially. So all atoms are now of the same color, actually green and red. Uh, so I've highlighted the bulk ions and the surface ions in order to show you why they are so different. So the free energy or the change in chemical potential that we've talked about, this is strictly speaking only for the bulk phase ions, so the green ones. This drives nucleation. And the surface ions, they cost free energy. Why? So I've plotted or I've drawn here the interaction forces for an ionic crystal that would be Coulomb forces, but also there are other contributions. And this is so the so-called cohesive energy. So if you add up all these arrows, which are forces, then you have a zero net force, which pulls like your bulk uh, solid together. However, on the surface, you have unsaturated so-called dangling bonds and you have missing coordination partners. Of course, here would be water molecules, but it's different arrow length uh, than the interaction with the other ions that are in the bike. So if you sum this up, you will remain with the tension, and that's why it's called also surface tension. And this you can measure as a macroscopic quantity, and it's actually what classical nucleation theory uses to calculate the free energy of the nuclei. Because now we are already have everything to together in essence to determine this uh, yeah, free energy change for classical nucleus form. So we have n times that the number of atoms, the affinity, kT ln s, plus sigma as the surface tension times the area of the nucleus. And I've just yeah, transformed this here into um, an expression for a spherical nucleus. So R would be the radius. And here we are, of course have the volume of the sphere. We want to relate the number of atoms to the volume. Then we need the molecular volume of the building units. Here's the affinity left. Uh, so remember, it has to be positive if nucleation occurs. 
So then we have the negative sign here. So delta G must be negative for a process to occur. However, here we have the antagonist, the counter player, which is the surface. So phi PR squared and the surface tension. So now we can discuss the different terms in the plot of the free energy over the radius of the nucleus. And we can look at the surface term first. So I said it costs free energy, so it's positive and it goes with R squared. So you have essentially the branch of a parabola. And for the uh, bulk free energy, it's actually a cubic function. So, and it's negative. So the green part here goes down. And you know, if you look at the derivative, you will see that uh, for the cubic function, actually it doesn't grow as quickly for small sizes as the, as the square function. So here we have a small increase compared to the red contribution, let's say. However, at large sizes, of course, the cubic function will dominate and it will become negative. So if you add the two up, and that's the full equation here, you end up with a profile like this. So at small sizes, you have a positive free energy for the nuclei that are forming, and you go over a maximum. Of course, this maximum you can find just by taking the derivative and putting it equal to zero. And this is the so-called critical free energy um, on the ordinate here and on the x-axis. Of course, we have the radius and here we have the critical radius or the critical size. And there's also an expression for it. And you can see it depends here on the surface tension. So surface tension cubed. And this is, of course, a strong effect of the, on the critical free energy. So if you can change the interfacial tension, then you will have a strong effect on nucleation. You will reduce um, the standard free energy barrier if you have a favorable interaction and surface. And that's why nucleation is mostly heterogeneous. And here you have the affinity. Um, so here's the ln of the supersaturation ratio. So this doesn't have a large effect, but it still will change the height of the nucleation barrier. And of course, within an Arrhenius approach, you can then calculate the nucleation rate. And here this prefactor C is what I've talked about before, where Vollmer and Weber made an error. And there's also sort of an extension from Seldovich. But the essence here is in the delta G, uh, essentially for this barrier of nucleation to occur. Okay, so you have the nucleus of critical size, and then you just grow ein by ein, essentially, to yield the final particle. And that's it, how it's envisioned, envisioned uh, in the textbook. However, you saw already that yeah, there's an alternative way, and of course, um, I will try to explain it in detail yeah, in the next um, part of my talk. However, what I would like to point out first is at this pre-critical nuclei, according to classical nu nucleation theory, they have to be very, very rare species because the standard free energy of formation is positive. That means the equilibrium constant that we can formally write down is very small and there should be essentially zero of them. So in another perspective, we can essentially only control this process from the point of view of classical nucleation theory by changing supersaturation just about uh, a certain uh, threshold uh, or introducing surfaces, as I've outlined before when we discussed the equation. So what is then non-classical nucleation or different concept of nucleation? And what I wanted to mention here is the concept of two-step nucleation, where you have like these fluctuations occurring um, divided into essentially two barriers. So it assumes that you first have a fluctuation in terms of concentration, so you enrich your species, however they are unordered or liquid-like, and then you have another fluctuation in the direction of structure, where you have the ordering towards a crystal nucleus, and um, this is the free energy profile. As the name indicates, you just have two steps, two nucleation barriers, and um, this is used to parametrize classical nucleation theory. And actually, there's a recent paper by Professor Kashyev who showed that this framework can be expressed completely in terms of yeah, expressions developed for classical nucleation theory. So you can parametrize it further uh, to yeah, match experimental data by this uh, theory, and it is often observed in protein 
crystallization. So this begs the question, what is actually classical and what is non-classical non -classical, um, in this crystallization world? And when you think about it, there are four major ways to come from atoms, molecules, or we are talking about ions, here, calcium carbonate, to solids. So you could go to an amorphous bulk phase, which then this would be Oswald ripening or Oswald step ripening, um, transform into a stable crystal in bulk phase. And you can have primary particles or clusters that take either direction or way. And all of these four yeah, scenarios could be in principle classical or non-classical. And what the community in essence agrees on would be classical ein bar ein growth and non-classical would be the involvement of larger oligomeric or polymeric or cluster species, however you might call them. However, you could also, so you see these primary particle clusters here, you could nucleate them classically and they would then grow ein by ein and this could be, be classical. So it's just rather sort of a focus on this process um, that we have to perform to be able to differentiate between the two. And that's what I said already. In principle, everything here could proceed via a classical or non-classical pathway. So one of the non-classical pathways is the so-called pinucleation cluster pathway, which we've developed in the last yeah, uh, 15 years or so. And the main difference is here that we start with stable clusters in the beginning. So there's not the problem of a phase separation. Um, it's a homogeneous solution equilibrium and uh, there's no barrier or such uh, separating this non-associated state from the associated state. And then phase separation is not so much based on the size of the clusters, but rather on their dynamics. So these species forming here are highly dynamic. Um, and at some point, and I will get back to that later when I explain like the evidence that led to the formulation of this, they reduce their dynamics. And when they reduce the dynamics, then we can formally define a phase interface between the solution and the clusters. So here the dynamics is essentially the same as the solution, here not anymore. So we can draw a sphere around it, which represents an interface, which costs free energy, I've showed you already. Um, and then this will drive aggregation and lead to the formation of larger liquid intermediates, which then solidify at first, become amorphous, and uh, finally can crystallize. So you see it's a much more complex multi-step mechanism, where of course we also have multiple handles um, to control and interfere, for example, with additives and thereby influence um, crystallization. I just wanted to walk you through the experimental evidence that led to the formation, a uh, formulation of, of this pathway. And um, Professor Kartnala mentioned this paper in 2008. That's where um, the story essentially started. So we showed by means of potentiometric titrations um, that calcium and carbonate ions are actually bound in so-called pre-nucleation clusters. Uh, I don't want to spend time in going into detail. We combined this with analytical ultracentrifugation, which is a very powerful technique, which showed that these species that are forming are not ion pairs, they are larger ent entities, so pre-nucleation clusters. And we formulated a speciation model, a thermodynamic one, to yeah, derive the standard free energy of formation. And it's negative. Uh, so these are stable species that are, they are not sort of these classical nuclei and um, also their stability is pH dependent. And what is shown here is not a kinetic curve. So the titration is done very slowly. We determined by means of potentiometric measurements, the ion activity product essentially is plotted on the y axis here. And these straight line, they are equilibrium stages. Uh, because the addition is so slow, so so um, the x-axis is actually calcium added, um, you could also imagine. Um, and then here the slope is inversely proportional to the stability of the ion associates that are forming. So you see with um, increasing pH, um, they get less and less stable. And you also see, so here's the solubility products of calcite and batterite, aragonite is here of two different amorphous forms of calcium carbonate. So we called them amorphous calcium carbonate one and two at that time, and already um, yeah, speculated that it may have to do with different structures 
in these amorphous calcium carbonates. So this is the really exciting part about this. We saw a link between pre-nucleation and post-nucleation uh, speciation or thermodynamics. So the more stable pre-nucleation clusters yielded a more stable ACC and the less stable, less stable ACC. So the question is, what are these different amorphous calcium carbonate? And we subsequently developed a method to um, isolate these particles. And you can see here, so this is classical TEM, just the quenched nanoparticles. They are maybe 10, 15, 20 nanometer in size. And here's the electron diffraction. So this is just the pair distribution function. You see here, this are uh, amorphous species clearly. And I will show you a high resolution image later too, where you can see the surface texture that there are no lattice fringes or anything. And what we did here is solid state NMR. You don't need to understand much about solid state NMR um, to understand this spectra. So on the x-axis here, we have essentially a chemical environment. Now, what I'm showing here is the spectra of calcite and batterite. So you see here one crystallographic carbonate, so this 13C solid state NMR in calcite, at least two in batterite with different populations. And you have much broader Gaussian-shaped lines for the two amorphous calcium carbonates. And you see that the maximum is centered at the chemical shifts for the batterite and the calcite. That's why we call them proto-calcite and proto-batterite amorphous calcium carbonate. And uh, we corroborated these notions also by IR spectroscopy and X-ray absorption spectroscopy, but I'm not going to discuss the data here. What I wanted to highlight though is that this proto-structuring does not predetermine any polymorph. So the proto-calcite ACC does not always transform into calcite, and that's the same for the proto-batterite. And you can understand this also from these solid state and MR spectra, because you have a distribution of environments, and here it's completely random where you nucleate. So if you nucleate a crystal in an environment here, then you will likely get batterite. If you nucleate here, you will likely get calcite. But um, this is just important to, to understand at that point. So we may say there's a missing polymorph, aragonite, and then we later, actually more recently, 2016, we found also the proto-aragonite ACC, and you can get it by increasing the temperature at the higher pH where the proto batterite forms. So if you increase the temperature at the pH where the proto calcite forms, you won't get there, which makes sense because proto calcite is probably the most stable form of it. And you can see this here in the uh, temperature-dependent IR data that above a certain temperature, you see here an increase in the intensity in the Nuvon vibration. And this is, of course, the vibration of the carbonate ion. So the carbonate ion is trigonal planar ion, and the Nuvon would be the symmetric stretch of it. And it's normally IR forbidden. So for, for the isolated ions, when they are in a um, isotropic environment, you shouldn't see this in, in, uh, in IR. You see it small as a, with small intensity for the amorphous specimens because they are partially disordered. However, due to the symmetry of the crystal structure in aragonite, it's allowed. And you see this increase here, and it's, it's a broad vibration, so it's obviously coupled with water. And we saw this as a first evidence of the formation of proto-aragonite ACC. So we did the solid state NMR again, and um, it's not in pure form. So you still have the proto-batterite left at the 196, but we have another contribution at 170.6, so roughly 171 uh, ppm, which is uh, the chemical shift of aragonite. And we also, yeah, saw that uh, in the X-ray absorption spectroscopy, so the calcium KH exhafts indicated that actually water plays a key role here, that um, the water is closer coordinated to the oxygen of the carbonate than to the calcium than in the other ACCs. And uh, this may also give rise to the formation of this dipole that we see here in the IR spectroscopy and which leads to the deshielding of the carbon uh, in the NMR spectroscopy. So here I'm showing the high resolution images of the amorphous calcium carbonate. So this is a proto calcite amorphous calcium carbonate. And you see that surface texture is consistent with an amorphous material. And at this, so this is 10 nanometers, at this magnification, if there were crystalline domains, you would see them as lattice fringes. However, there are none. What you see 
when you play with a focus, this in certain focus plane features like that. Uh, and I've highlighted with arrow, I hope you can see on your computer screen. So they are in the size range of two nanometers. So there seem to be some cluster building units making up these ACCs. And in size, by analytical ultracentrifugation in solution, we also determined the prenucleation clusters to be roughly two nanometers in size. So these might just be remnants. And this begs the question, what are these prenucleation clusters? So why are they stable? What is going on? And in order to answer this question, we teamed up with Julian Gale and Paolo Raiteri and Rafaela de Michelis from Curtin University in, in Western Australia, and they perform computer simulations. And what I'm going to show you here is a movie of this computer simulation. What is shown here is calcium carbonate ion pairs. So this is actually a crystal structure of Ica. It's not important at this point, just important to know that the water is, of course, left out. Water is in here, of course, intrinsically, but not shown because otherwise you wouldn't be able to see anything. So, and if I start the simulation or the, the movie of the simulation, you see that the ions quickly begin to associate into a chain-like form, which is very dynamic uh, and constantly changes yeah, connectivity and also ions are lost, but then reattach. And we call this a dynamically ordered liquid like oxyanion polymer, which is the structural form of this pinucleation clusters and which nicely explains, in our opinion, the observation. So there's a nice agreement with yeah, the experimental thermodynamics that I outlined and also the coordination numbers. And what I'm showing here is a plot of the Helmholtz free energy about above the radius of duration of a, I think, six formula unit cluster. And you see like at large sizes, you essentially have a flat energy landscape. So you can change um, the shape of these clusters at essentially no energetic cost. That's why we call them liquid-like. However, if you try to condense them and get rid of the hydration water internally, there's a barrier towards nucleation, so to speak and they can't transform in this manner. So the question is, how do they transform? And evidence for this came again from computer simulations. And um, these were carried out by another group around G uh, Jim Diorio, but uh, Julian Gale and Paolo Raiteri actually was, were also part of this team. And they suggested that actually there's a submerged liquid-liquid coexistence gap in the uh, aqueous calcium carbonate system. So we have here uh, in a typical phase diagram on the y-axis, the temperature, on the right axis, the ion activity product. And that's what we actually did in the titrations. So at the constant temperature, room temperature, we add ions together. So we generate supersaturation. This would be here the solubility of calcite for simplicity, just one solid form. And here we are in the supersaturated regime. And here, of course, there's no violation of Gibbs phase rule. We can have the coexistence of two liquids, uh, which is defined by this liquid-liquid coexistence. And what they saw in the simulations is that first these dollops form, and then like at some point, they would internally develop higher coordination numbers, hence develop the interface and aggregate um, to form solid ACC. So this begs the question, how do you show this experimentally? How do you determine the ion activity product where this process can happen and occur? And we were lucky to do actually the right experiments, which is terahertz absorption spectroscopy. So this was done in collaboration with Martina Havenit in Bochum. And you've seen a similar curve before already. This is this titration experiment where we record the ion activity product essentially while adding calcium solution in a carbonate buffer, so generating supersaturation and observing nucleation at some point. And what we did was just collect samples at different stages, which I already assigned here, and measure the integrated terahertz absorption relative to water. And uh, the terahertz absorption spectroscopy is a type of vibrational spectroscopy. However, you do not probe uh, molecular vibration, strictly speaking, but you probe the, yeah, the, the water hydrogen bond network dynamics, so to speak. And what we see here is a very similar curve to that one, just the same points here because we probe just uh, certain mixtures. Um, however, you have the maximum in the curve 
as you transition here between the two regimes one and two. And this initial increase is a so-called terahertz excess, and we interpreted this to be due to pre-nucleation cluster formation. So we have an increase above the dynamics of bulk water, and you may understand by, by looking at the thermodynamics of ion association in solution. And I put this because it's really important to make this uh, clear to yourself. What is the driving force underlying ion association in solution and also ion binding, for example, to polyelectrolytes? It's also been shown uh, for this. And what I'm show showing here is actually uh, gibbs helmholtz plots to extract the free energy change um, from essentially a temperature dependent uh, measurement of the equilibrium constant. And from that, you can extract the delta H standard and the delta S standard. And we also did it directly by a method called isothermal titration calorimetry. So the black points here is also um, from computer simulations, but I'm, I'm not going into detail. So as gibbs helmholtz uh, predicts, we, we see a line essentially, and from the extrapolation, we can uh, determine the entropy and, and also from slope, the entropy and from the extrapolation, uh, the enthalpy. And you see the delta H is positive. You remember the delta G is negative. That means ion association is endothermic. It's not the Coulomb bond that is driving this ion association process. Because in water, the ions have to get rid of hydration water molecules in order to come together. So for the formation of the calcium carbonate bond, they get rid of or give up um, ion water coordinations. And all over integrated, there's a penalty. So what's driving the process of ion association in water is actually the degrees of freedom that are generated in the water while it's released from the hydration layers. And this is two or three waters, depending on the assumptions that you make per um, associated calcium carbonate molecule. And this is actually very similar um, to the thermodynamics of amphiphilic self-assembly. And this is why actually the ion association doesn't stop at the ion pair. It's just um, yeah, beneficial to continue to larger clusters until, of course, the the entropy tilts over and it's better to have the single lines. So the pinucleation cluster formation is driven by the release of hydration waters. And that's what we think we see in this terahertz absorption. But then at this uh, entering the supersaturated regime, you essentially have a decrease in the dynamics. And we interpreted this to be due to the occlusion of these mobile waters within and between the nano droplets that formed at this point uh, in the titration profile. So we can formally write down the dominating equilibria for these three regimes, one, two, three, as first just the ion association, which of course has an equilibrium constant. In this equilibrium constant, we can also calculate the free energy that I showed you. Then we have a formal liquid-liquid coexistence, which has to happen here because we have a change in the dynamics. So the water behaves completely differently once we get into this regime, and this can only be due to liquid-liquid separation, where we can write down another equilibrium constant. Then we are in the kinetic regime, and we approach here the solubility of this very, very special form of amorphous calcium carbonate, and in this case, it's protocalcite amorphous calcium carbonate, and this, of course, has also a solubility, and because we define the solution, uh, the solution equilibrium in this direction, it's the um, uh, one over uh, the ion activity product um, for the solubility constant. So there are two important things to point out here, which are very interesting and give a lot of insight actually into the system. So you see here liquid-liquid separation occurs. So we come from a homogeneous into a heterogeneous system, which is described by these equilibrium constants. However, there's no kink or change in slope. That means the free energy changes continuously and not abruptly, so we have a higher order phase transition, which is expected also for liquid-liquid uh, separation, of course. And then what's even more interesting is that obviously this happens as we are supersaturated with respect to the special form of amorphous calcium carbonate. So this means that the thermodynamic stability of the solid that was the first form determines the point at which liquid-liquid separation 
occurs. And you can rationalize this by saying what happens here is essentially the solidification or the dehydration of the liquid, dense liquid that is forming here. And here it is a solid and has then uh, a solubility. And I, we don't have the time to go into detail, but based on this mechanism, you can actually formulate a predictive framework to yeah, describe the liquid-liquid coexistence, which um, takes some time to digest, I know that. Um, but what I'm showing here is essentially just um, the, the quantitative reflection of what, what we've seen before uh, from the Deorio science paper of the liquid-liquid coexistence which also includes the amorphous polymorphism. So the data points that I'm showing here, these are the experimental points for the solubilities of the different forms. So the proto-aragonite ACC, the proto ACC, and the proto ACC. And here we have um, the literature solubility of amorphous calcium carbonate prepared from very high supersaturations. Uh, and this is sort of our experimental measure or points measured for the spinodal um, predicted on this model. So essentially, you have a triple point here for ex existence of different structured dense liquids, and it depends on the kinetics of the dehydration, which sort of amorphous calcium carbonate solid you may get. So you may get any amorphous calcium carbonate with any solubility in between this and this value. And um, I don't want to go into detail, details with the equations. You can predict these lines here. So these are this is, the lines are the model um, by just measuring the constants. So you need to know the ion association constant, the solubility, and this A parameter here we determined. So it's close to 1.5, one and a half maybe um, for the different systems. So this brings me to my conclusions, uh, more or less on time. So. I hope I could convince you that we were able in the last uh, 10 to 15 years maybe to introduce a quantitative, now quantitative non-classical theory of phase separation, which is based on so-called prenucleation clusters for the calcium carbonate system. It inherently explains amorphous polymorphism, so a quite surprising aspect that we see and which may play, of course, a major role also in controlling then crystal polymorphism. And we can also reconcile yeah, variable ACC solubilities that have been reported in the literature throughout the years. The model predicts uh, the liquid-liquid coexistence region. And in the long run, it may also help to understand better how additives interact with the different stages or precursors of calcium carbonate. And that's what I'm at least getting to. Um, so. We can rationalize with these more complex pathways the rather yeah, complicated additive control patterns that we see. And I just wanted to mention the so-called polymer-induced liquid precursor, which was discovered by Lori Gauer, um, which of course can be nicely explained here uh, by just stabilizing these liquid-liquid separated states by polycarboxylates, by just keeping the water uh, inside of these phases. And of course, you can use them for making materials. And there's also, I think, uh, now consensus in the biomineralization community that it plays a large role in making this um, very fascinating biominerals. This, of course, begs the question if um, this mechanism and pathway is more general, perhaps, and of broader relevance. And over the years, we have been studying different compounds now. I think we've shown for iron oxyhydroxides, it's a similar way for calcium phosphates, for barium sulfate, aluminum oxyhydroxides. We are now also looking into small organic molecules and it's not the same everywhere. There's sometimes spectacular differences, but um, there seems to be a lot of promise uh, in these notions of this new pathway. And as I showed you, and maybe as a take home message at this point is that the water actually, the solvent plays the main role. I didn't show it and I'm in a minute, I'm going to show again the scheme that we've now walked through in detail. The water is not shown, but actually it's the water that plays the main role at each step. 
It plays the main role in ion association. It plays the main role in liquid-liquid phase separation. It plays the main role in the protostructures of the amorphous intermediates, and it probably plays the main role in the following crystallization pathways. So if you have like this hydration water release driven association, be it ions or molecules in water, and you get something that's chain like uh, as a precursor, then the model that we've developed should work uh, in principle. So with this, I would like to thank many people who helped. I'm not going to read all the names. I've mentioned uh, many of them already during my talk. Um, so this um, Developments of the model was, were also done in collaboration with Karin Hauser. There are several people from my group I would like to thank, of course, um, where the money came from. And last but not le least, I would like to thank you for your kind attention and Professor Kartner again for the nice uh, invitation and the opportunity to present our research here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. It's a great presentation for me specifically it's nothing close to my research line so of course uh, i would like the presentation but i think it was very uh, easy to to understand this very complex you know because people think oh calcium carbonate it's such an easy salt why is it so complicated and there's this uh, uh, such complex chemistry behind it that leads to a lot of understanding you know about the the physical chemistry aspect of, of crystallization. So uh, we have. Is it okay with you if we open for questions? Yes, of course. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, so we have uh, Tayani. If you would like to. Can we see? Uh, I don't. I, I don't think your camera is on, but we can hear you. Uh, ah. Uh, okay. Boa tarde, é, professor, and, and first, and congratulations for a presentation, um, and professor Vinícius, and you, you wanna, uh, okay. 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 É, ele fala, ele mostra um gráfico num pH é, igual a 10, né? Num pH alcalino. Eu queria saber se é, já houve o um interesse de pesquisar é, a dinâmica né, da formação do carbonato de cálcio no, num pH mais ácido, né? Tanto termodinamicamente como cineticamente, porque, né, tendo em vista, né, o, por exemplo, a acidificação dos oceanos, né? A dinâmica do, do equilíbrio é alterada pela acidez do, do meio, né? Então, eu queria saber se ele tem uma linha de pesquisa é, pesquisando né, essa dinâmica no pH mais ácido. Uh -huh. Ok, Denise. Uh, I think that if you could go to slide 24, she was actually uh, asking about uh -huh. the... Yeah, because uh, uh, most of the studies, and I think since the, the first uh, article in, from Science in 2008, uh, most of the work has been done in, in alkaline pH, right? And she asked if uh, your group has done works in, in the lower pHs as well, thinking about the acidifications of oceans and, and how it could uh, affect. And in my input as well, because uh, here in Brazil, my, my research group is work with uh, the oil and gas company. So you have major problems with calcium carbonate while producing oil, especially in the pre-salt, which uh, the, there is the, the carbonaceous rock. So the, the water that is produced has a lot of CO2 as well. So uh, has your group also worked with with uh, lower pH? Yes, we, we did. Um, I didn't include it here just for the sake of time. Um, I guess I could uh, talk much longer on calcium carbonate. <laughs> so of course you're completely right. So um, it, it is, it plays a huge role. So you see a lot of stuff changes or a lot of this, the mechanism and what's occurring changes between pH nine and 10. And um, so 
almost as much changes again if you go below. So we've had, I think it's published 2019. Um, we've developed, developed like, or continued to develop this titration method to be able to cope with lower pH values because like the at least concentration of carbonate buffer that we use between pH 9 and 10, uh, actually CO2 will in diffuse, but you can neglect it. We showed that. And if you go below pH 9, then of course CO2 will start to diffuse out. So you have to, in order to remain quantitative, you have to counter titrate in, in addition with, with, with HCl. And we did that and also saw like the calcium bicarbonate association. And what is happening in a nutshell is that you have um, calcium bicarbonate ion pairs starting to play a role in speciation. Um, however, they don't seem to directly interfere with the crystallization. However, you have with the same equilibrium constant, you have the bicarbonate ions binding to the pinucleation clusters. And this leads to around five to almost 10% of the bicarbonate ending up as a structural constituent of the amorphous calcium carbonate. So you have bicarbonate in the structure um, of the amorphous calcium carbonate, which seems to also stabilize it genetically against uh, crystallization. Um, and there's a lot remaining to discover. So before also we published a paper with, with Lori Gauer and one of her PhD students, uh, Mark Bevernitz, and he showed early on already that bicarbonate actually plays a big role in stabilizing this liquid-liquid saturated states, probably also by interacting with the surface because as you know, like at, at pH 8.5, 98% or so is bicarbonate. So there's only a very few carbonate, which still dominates the ion association, but there's like a lot of stuff going on around it. And there's a lot of room for research. Okay, thank you, Professor. Okay, thank you. Uh, Beatrice? sent on, on the chat. She sent the, the question in the chat. I don't know if you, you can. Do you want me to read? Yes, it would be nice. I okay. I only see you and okay. my... Okay. Okay, so she thanked you for the for the presentation. Uh, she said that it's very different from, from her research area. In the, so she had some, some questions. Uh, she's, in a nosy, she's in a noisy place. And the, her connection is very unstable. That's why she she typed on on the chat. Uh, first, uh, a very simple question: How the terahertz spectroscopy works? Uh, is the first time that she she saw this. Could you just briefly uh, talk a little well, bit? About I I am anything but an expert in in terahertz spectroscopy. So we visited um, like the setup once. And it's actually very similar to a, to an attenuated total reflection IR setup. So um, it's of course different wave numbers. So you, you go to even lower wave numbers and then sort of, so to speak classical IR to be able to observe the lattice vibration and beyond. But you can envisage it to be very similar. However, it's also very difficult to interpret because you get sort of in an acoustic uh, domain of, of vibrations, right? So um, just by, by the setup, it looks very similar and it works also in a hand-waving manner similar to IR spectroscopy. And that's a way to wrap your head around it. But it's not so easy to interpret. Um, it just sort of works in combination and we just used it or we're lucky to use it um, to see the changes. And Martina Havenet, she actually used it mostly to, to explore protein folding and such phenomena where, of course, water also plays a key role. You have other questions? Uh, she asked, uh, how impurities in nature can influence the, the whole process? Uh, do, you, do you study this competition process and how other, maybe ions, maybe other components in solution can affect the... the... Yes, 
uh, unfortunately, I didn't put any slides on this because I wanted to keep it short. So we have studied the the effects of of many different additives. So from ions to polymers to proteins, peptides. And um, so these experiments, they allow us to categorize the different actions these additives have and also to quantify it. So it, it goes from just iron binding to influencing this pre-nucleation equilibria to influencing the point of nucleation, influencing the formation of intermediates, their stabilization and so forth. And um, yeah, what is actually included in this Terra Health paper is also the role of the polycarboxylates. So what you see is just an enormous delay of the nucleation point um, to higher ion activity products. So the curve goes like on and on and on and on, even though you've, you add just tiny amounts, which are impurities essentially of polycarboxylates. And you still see this change in the Terra Health signal at this low point. So everything above that you see is a stabilized liquid-liquid separated state you know, by this polycarboxylate. And it's very, very interesting because polyaspartic acid and polyglutamic acid, which just have one CH2 difference in the side chain, they com behave completely different. And we've also studied um, like recombinant proteins that we made just from biomineralization. And it's like a very complex scenario. For it's unpublished work. Um, however, we saw that some proteins from biomineralization, they don't show any effect at pH 10, no effect at pH 9. But as you start to go into this bicarbonate regime, then they kick in. Yeah. So, and that doesn't have to do anything with the folding of the protein or so. It doesn't change also the protonation. It seems to be just the interaction with the mineral where bicarbonate again plays a role. So there's a lot of complexity also to discover in this. Yes. And even like the simplest ions, magnesium does a huge deal. So, and of course, magnesium also occurs in seawater, so it's important. Great. Beatrice, all good or one more? Okay. She's gonna write. Uh, before reading your your last one, let me just. Uh, it's very curious, Dennis, that that you brought this up because uh, I have a student. She's actually here, and we we've been uh, studying some uh, the effects of different uh, sizes of sugar molecules and how we affect the the now in application how we can prevent calcium carbonate to for, to form inside two minutes and you may have the the same quantities if you have glucose or if you have uh starch uh soluble starch all you have is the, the polymerized glucose and the glucose it affects nothing it's not gonna inhibit the formation of calcium carbonate but starch will and just by the the chain so it's it's very curious that that you have the Yes, I, I mean, you're right. Also, polymerization degree or molecular weight, it plays a huge role. Yes. And then also, of course, the secondary structure. Um, so, yes. And and for, for I, I completely agree with you. It's important to study carbohydrates because, I mean, they have been neglected for a long time because it's much more complex especially also in biomineralization, because many of the biomineralization proteins, they also carry sugars on, on top, so they are proteoglycans, right? Mm -hmm. But we only focus for a long time on, on the peptide uh, chains, but there's a lot of stuff on the surface that we don't understand yet. And we, we also did uh, some study on different, different carbohydrates, and there are spectacular differences as well, which we don't really understand yet. So, but it may be just down to the complexity of this pathway. So you can understand that maybe a certain structure is more likely to interact efficiently at this stage and another structure maybe at this stage. So, yes. Okay, uh, Beatrice asked uh, her last question. Uh, the computer simulation that you, that you showed on slide 19, uh, is it specific for calcium carbonate or was it performed using uh, usual software of molecular dynamics? 
Well, I, I'm, I'm again not an expert on <laughs> computer simulations. Um, so this is anything but routine, I would say. So, um, so there was a lot of effort put at that time. This is already 10 more, more than 10 years old, so we could probably do better in the meantime. Um, but I think the, the main results are still standing. You may know that there's a lot of work also published challenging this. I didn't really go into detail. I, I don't. I think we replied to all the challenges. Uh, so, in my opinion, it still stands, and we are also now working on, of course, in collaboration with Julian and Paolo, to try to simulate other species. However, like the casein carbonate is, of course, for the computer simulation because it's so simple, in a way, also um, the most suited. Yes, but it should. Simple work also for other uh, chemistries. However, I don't think you will get meaningful results with just standard material studio software. Also, that's not usually how it's done. Hey, Beatrice. Yes, she has her camera on. Um, uh, okay. The, the next one, Lucas. And hi, can you hear me, Professor? Yes, I can hear you well. Uh, okay, and thanks very much for your presentation. It was very, very interesting. And I have a question. Uh, you have shown in the beginning of your presentation on nucleation free energy as a function of the radius. That looks very similar to me as a as a reaction mechanism coordinate. Uh, my question is the following. Can we think of in the in the nucleus of critical size as a activated complex uh, similar to the transition state theory? or that's not, not related? I, I, I think you're right. I mean, the essence is very similar. So you can think of, of the critical nucleus as, a, um, as, a, as an activated complex. However, there are, of course, some caveats. So um, the theory is formulated in a very different manner. So if you think of the basic Eyring theory, it's formulated for an elementary reaction. And um, the formation of a classical nucleus includes, of course, a series of elementary reactions. However, like from the point of view of a free energy landscape, it's essentially the same. Um, so I would agree, yes. You, you, you can think of it in energy. Yes. And I mean, the expression that comes out is very similar anyways, right? So. Yes, yes. And it, it is possible to, to make an iron plot to obtain the entropy, the entropy transition or, or the entropy for, the, yeah. for this complex. I've been thinking about that too. So, um, I don't have a straightforward answer, but I think it's, it takes a nice perspective because if you think about it from the point of view of Iring, of course, your uh, activation entropy is in the prefactor, and um, that leaves then your activation entalpy in the barrier. Um, so that's also where you, of course, relate to an, to an activation energy in terms of, of Arrhenius, because what you would normally plot is not over a free entalpy landscape. But I'm not so sure if it goes anywhere useful, really, uh, in this sense, because, of course, what Iring or what the activated complex doesn't seem to capture is the supersaturation dependence of the nucleation rate, right? So this is pretty unique to, to nucleation theory. So there, there are many analogies, but of course, at some point, you differ in the de derivation, and here you're mostly interested in yeah, capturing the dependence of the rate on your concentration or supersaturation. 
which is not of interest for ironing, right? There you would just sort of measure rates uh, in a temperature dependent manner and then extract um, your activation parameters. And here you would measure rates in a super saturation dependent manner and extract your, your barrier or your critical size. Yeah, thank you very much for your answer. Any more questions? Those were the one with the raised hands. Yes. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, Dennis, the the in the end, you commented on other types of salts that form. I I I don't know if if I understood. Uh, it follows the liquid liquid phase. Uh, or that at least like follows similar pathway uh, in the early stages. Yes, so that's this slide you mean, right? Yeah, yeah. So barium sulfate as well. Yes. Yes, it's uh, that should be published. Yes, I think so. So very recently we published also on magnesium hydroxide. It just came out a week ago or so. So the the list is filling up. So the closer you look. <laughs> Everything behaves a little bit more strangely than than you may have thought. So yes, I think it's it's very interesting to to because uh, even as chemists, you know, even because here we have students from all sorts of areas. So we only know the basics, as I told you. Many wouldn't know the only the basics about crystallization, and to understand that it's very uh, complex. It's not very simple. It's still being Discussed. It's I, I mean, don't get me wrong. It isn't like exactly the same as calcium carbonate. So uh -huh. it, it's like there's tiny differences. So also the chemistry plays a major role, of course. So and you think about the, the, the iron oxides, then of course you have a hydrolyzing condensating system. So the pH values are completely different. The reactivity is completely different. And also the, the idea of chemical bonding in the different species is different. So you have olation versus oxalation, which is important to consider. And but like in a broader framework is similar. So but you, you have to always take into account the chemistry that's that's different. And that's already the case for calcium phosphate. So you may say probably calcium phosphate looks very similar to calcium carbonate. No, no, no. It's just a Calcium carbonate is already complex. The calcium phosphate is extremely difficult to understand. I think. Yeah, but but seeing the the barium sulfate, I was curious because uh, for the oil and gas industry, it's also a, a huge problem. So to to in in the end, understanding how we actually nucleate because uh, you, you have even a more complex system because you have pressure and you have another phase that is oil. Yes, and, and it's very difficult to find effective anti-scalants, right? So whereas like for calcium carbonate, these polycarboxylates do a good job, I think for barium sulfate, no way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and to find the products is, is the, the goal and the, the technology that needs to be uh, really understood. And it's especially calcium carbonate because uh, the industry finds a lot of problem uh, with calcium carbonate and emulsion. They see that the, the solid is actually on the interface between the water droplets and the oil itself. So if you think mechanistically of the whole process coming from, from the liquid liquid phase and the water and the dehydration and how it goes to the interface and so it's very complex. Yes, I agree. I mean, you you then so so to speak couple different phase coexistence also. I mean, it's also like just if you leave the oil away, yeah. Well, <laughs> you, you can also like of course you have core acidization. So if you have these polymers, they could also make salts with just the calcium ions, right? So or barium or whatever you're looking at. Yes. So there's a lot of uh, things to consider. Yes, I agree. Okay, I think that uh, those were the, the 
take questions from the students. It's still the, the beginning of the semester. They're still a little bit shy, but I think that it's it's very important to to give them this uh, view that something so simple as crystallization and something as simple as calcium carbonate in theory is actually so complex and there is a, a major area that is still being discussed, being debated, and a lot of things is still under discussion and a lot of research is still to, to arrive. So I, I want to thank you again for having the time to come here and show us a little bit and just a little bit as you said you had to leave a, a lot of questions a lot of things um, outside but i want to thank you again for for coming here and this is it yeah thanks for having me it was it was great fun actually and it was also very good questions so i enjoyed the the question session and maybe in the future, you, you give us a presentation here in Rio. <laughs> that would be great. Yes, I would love to. OK, thank you again, Dennis. I'm going to stop the, the recording. <laughs>